the meeting at um, 6.33. Um, let's do roll call. Jill? Here. Anakit? Here. Emma? Here. Mara? Here. Ryan? Ryan? He's sitting here. Yeah, okay. Let me give it a thumbs up. It's like it's only wrong with your audio. All right. Bridget? Here. Jerry? Here. Hi, Tina. Um, so, uh, first uh, item is uh, public comment. Um, If you, uh, let me just put the participant thing on. Um, if you want to speak, please use the raise hand function. Um, I'm seeing three, four. <clears throat> All right, um, so let's start with, uh, we've got a Julia, Amanda, Kimberly, and Melissa. Um, so let's start with Julia. Um, go ahead and please uh, introduce yourself uh, for the folks at home and for the recording. Hi, I'm Julia Shapitz, um, Montpelier resident and parent of a almost first grader any day now um uh thanks for for uh taking the time to hear me again <laughs> um i just wanted to um say something about the um the meeting coming up on the 16th um where we're expecting that you're going to take up um conversations regarding the school resource officer and looking at the policy and the budget decisions around that and um Folks have been asking us how to engage with this discussion, how to engage with and making sure that their voices are heard and um, we don't have answers. So um, we need some transparency in that process um, to be clear of the, have a clear idea for ourselves and for, you know, to share with others about how um, your process will go around the policy and budget discussion um, and how we can engage in it as residents and parents and caregivers and um, community members. So anything you can speak to that now would be helpful, but also, you know, if, if you don't have immediate answers, um, it'd be really helpful uh, to have soon. Um, I will, no, I'll just give some, some clarity now, because we usually don't go back and forth on this, but I think it would be helpful. Um, I think some of those decisions will be made on the 16th about, you know, what our decision-making process is going to look like for this, um, kind of depending on, on what we hear and what we think is necessary. Um, you know, right now you've, you know, all the board board knows, um, you know, the, uh, you know, we'll be taking it up on the 16th. Um, you know, Libby's going to, um, kind of make a decision and we'll confer about kind of what sort of information to bring, um, you know, to that meeting. Um, and then, you know, the board will make a decision about whether there's a process there or whether, you know, there's a decision to be made at that meeting. It'll probably be, you know, some sort of process that leads to a decision. Um, in terms of participation at the meeting, um, you know, the two best ways to reach out and give input are, what you're doing now to show up at public comment, um, and also uh, you know written correspondence via email, um, and all of the board members as well as the administrators uh, emails are on uh, the website. So, um, so that's that's basically you know the process and the ability to weigh in. You know if, if we uh, you know have further process, which is definitely a, a possibility for the process in terms of you know a more formalized process to make a decision um you know we'll give details about that the 16th and again um you know have um uh clear clear lines for you know how to comment but obviously you know the, everything the board 
does. It has to do in public. So um, you're you're seeing what's happening, and again, you know, um, public comment and uh, written uh, correspondence is, is the best way to get input. Uh, Jim, can I ask a quick clarifying question on um, public? How is there any way for the public and the board to interact asking and answering questions in real time together in community? It seems like email doesn't provide for that and we don't respond to public comment. And yeah, so I'm just not sure how you could have a conversation together. I think we can definitely give thoughts about how how we might want to do that. Um, I mean, that's definitely a possibility. We would have to uh, we would have to dedicate either part of a meeting or some sort of special community event to do that. But it's it's a it's a possibility. Um, great, thank you, um, Amanda. Thank you, Jim. Hi, my name is Amanda Garces. I am um, a parent of two beautiful children, one who is going to be a second grader and the other one still in preschool uh, with an IEP. And um, yeah, I mean, I read the article that was in the newspaper. So obviously there are conversations between the district and the chief of the police. And then, you know, we have been bringing these conversations to this board in the hopes that there is some community involving in, in ensurance that the voices of our families of color are um, really listened to. I, I, I think that um, for me, it's like being, you know, like we, we have been asking, okay, what's going to happen? And now that there are articles, that there are obvious conversations between the district and the chief of police, like what, you know, like not being able to know um, what's going to happen and how we can be part of this conversation and alter and creating either alternatives of what it is. I know that, um, yeah, so like being in the dark as a parent uh, that have concerns about this, it's, um, I don't think it's transparent. And, and I think it's, it will be really important to ensure that our voices are heard. Um, whether it is in that meeting, but that we, we can also have like in advance what is going to be discussed so that we can prepare for whoever it is that we need to bring to the public comment. So um, again, just like asking for transparency and asking to ensure that our voices are heard as something that is really deeply um, that I care about. I was really, really concerned about the fact that uh, the, the article in the newspaper says that the, the, chief, the, the police, the school resource officer will be in the middle school. And given that some of the issues that have happened in the middle school, like I, I it just literally, it gave me a stomach pains from just like thinking about that. So um, yes, again, asking for transparency. Thank you so much. Great. Um, thank you. Um, Kimberly. So I am uh, Kimberly Cruikshank, and I have two girls, one going to Main Street Middle School and one going to Roxbury Village School. I am on this call to ask about the bus, number one, um, for Main Street Middle School, uh, for the first two days, I got an email that it is going in the morning, but there was not confirmation on what time in the afternoon. I am concerned about the bus schedule for Main Street Middle School because I do have a fifth grader and music starts at 2 p.m. virtually. And I'm not sure what time the bus gets home on at Roxbury, so that is a concern. So uh, that's issue number one. Uh, issue number two is, what is the bus situation, and I call it a situation at this point, with Roxbury Village School, and because I've heard um, many different scenarios being offered, and um, but when this merger all happened, we were promised the bus, and I understand that this is COVID times now, but if we get rid of the bus now, that just tells me that the bus, the budgeted line for the bus will probably go away and not come back the following years. So that is a concern to me. And I realize that there's only eight families using this bus, but it is 
if I was to go back to the office, then I rely on that bus just as well as any other of those eight families. So it is very concerning that there are options being offered that don't make real sense. So I just want some transparency around it. Great, thanks. And you know, the RBS bus is uh, part of the, the board session update later on. Um, uh, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, Melissa. Hi, I'm also a parent of an RBS second grader um, and would have been Roxbury Preschool. Unfortunately, we're going to Northfield. Um, we, again, it's about the bus. Um, I, Kimmy, I share some of Kimmy's same concerns. Um, the other concern I also have is we have at least four middle school students who are typically picked up by the RVS bus from the other side of town and they no longer have a way for their parents to put them on the bus before going to work. They then have to tra travel, some of them, nine to ten miles from the normal bus stop. That's not the two or three miles they already traveled to the nearest bus stop to drop their students at, I, I think it's 7 a.m. or 7.10 now. And then they also have elementary students on the RVS bus who they would then have to come back around for 740 to drop those students at school if there was no RVS bus. So my concern is, is that the RVS bus serves two purposes. It's one to get the kids from the other side of town over to meet the MS, MS bus. And it also obviously picks up the elementary students. I know eight families, this doesn't sound like a lot, but when you have 31 kids in a school, it's a decent percentage of the school that utilizes that bus. I mean, yes, it, in the number of kids, it sounds low, but if you look at, I don't know what the percentage of Montpelier is that uses the bus for their elementary and middle school, but when you look at it in percentage, I'm betting it's not too far off um, for those students. And I think it's an extreme hardship current, given the unknowns of this year to eliminate that bus. I understand that there's an issue with the driver being sick and there's out of the district's control, but eliminating the bus at this point is in the district's control. And I don't necessarily agree with the elimination of it for those eight families. I am one of those, I am working from home, but that's not guaranteed to last. And at the point I have to go back to work, my 7, 705 bus route is a necessity because we don't, we work in not far away places. We work in Montpelier, we work in Barrie. And 740 drop off at school to get to work for eight o'clock in those locations is just not feasible. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Meredith Warner, I think is the last one. Yes, hi, thank you. My name is Meredith Warner. I'm a Montpelier resident. Um, this is a follow up uh, to requests for process around the SRO question. Um, my concern is really um, a request, I guess, for the board to really consider how testimony from families of BIPOC children and of children with disabilities can be received by the board in a really meaningful way, um, a way that doesn't expose them to any kind of um, harm in providing that or exposure in providing that testimony. So I guess the request is uh, in that process, uh, how will uh, their testimony be considered and also how will it be weighted? So is that is that testimony for students that are potentially vulnerable in this conversation? Is their, um, is their experience of it weighted differently? Thank you. Thanks. Um, any other public comment? <coughs> Uh, well, thanks everyone. We will, um, again, we'll be taking that, taking that up on the 16th. We'll try to get the agenda out as soon as possible and get as much clarity as we can about, um, you know, how the, <clears throat> that discussion will take shape. But, um, yeah, we are, it, you know, the, the, the board is, is not, is not hiding information on, on the SRO question or on the busing question. You know, and these are <clears throat> evolving issues and we're, uh, um, you know, again, we are by law an open an open board. So all our deliberations uh, are are public and, uh, you know, you're, 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 seeing, you're seeing what's happening in, in real time. Um, 
the first uh, first item uh, beyond that is the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. With I'll second that. And seconded by Bridget. Uh, any discussion? Great. Let's uh, do a vote. Jill. Aye. Um. Annika. Aye. Emma. Aye. Mara. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Bridget. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Great, the uh, consent agenda passes. Um, so board discussion, uh, Libby, you want to tell us the latest? I know we're getting very close to, to launch time, so. Um, okay. Yes, we are. <laughs> um, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're frozen. Oh, no, am I? I we can hear you, but. Um, Hold on. Oh, no. There you go, you can see you now. Moving. Sorry, mom. I'm interrupting my mother's dinner. Hi. Uh, <laughs> am I better? Am I unfrozen now? Yes, we can see, we can see you. So, um, first and, and foremost, the administrators that you see on this Zoom call should get medals of honor. Um, they are really in it right now. And um, from a superintendent's perspective that once in service starts, then I'm kind of just the cheerleader on the side. Um, but these administrators are doing an amazing job and are incredibly stressed out. And I still made them come to the board meeting tonight <laughs> um, in case anybody had any questions that they can answer that I can't. So I just want to publicly acknowledge that these people are working so amazingly hard and are, I am so appreciative of every single one of them and the work that they're doing. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of at the point of go time where we're testy and we're short and we're just trying to get it to work. And then we put a public face on for teachers and, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, this team is really working very hard. So I have to, I have to say that before I get into any kind of update, um, and administrators, please jump in during this update. If you feel like you have better information. So the first thing I wanted to update the board on are, um, vacancies. So we do have vacancies right now that um, everybody should be aware of. Uh, as of right now, we have a grade eight humanities teacher. We need a long-term sub for that position. Uh, we need a social studies teacher. That's 0.7 at, at, at uh, MHS. It will be 1.0 for this year because we need the additional FTE for this year. But the interviews are happening, I believe, on Friday for that position. We need a 0.5 preschool teacher at RBS. We need a world language teacher at MSMS, but I believe those interviews are happening tomorrow. Is that true, Katie? Or soon? We we met today and hopefully uh, next week we'll be scheduling okay. them. We've been through applicants today. Okay. Uh, we have a grade five, six multi-age teacher, which Mike and I will talk to you about in a bit. We have a 0.5 FTE special educator at RVS that, is, that we're still trying to hire for. We only have one application for that. We have several instructional assistants that we need to hire for. Right now, I'm listing four, but there could possibly be five. We have 1.5 FTEs in our custodial staff that we need to hire for. We have two food service positions that we need to hire for, and we need three bus monitors. So we have a lot of vacancies happening. Um, some of these we can handle internally. Many of them we can handle internally for a short time period, but um, that's concerning with so many vacancies and school starts on Tuesday. Um, so we have zero applicants for the custodial positions. Those have been up for quite a long time now. Um, our bus monitors kind of, we had it all figured out and now they've dropped like flies. So we, uh, we've put out a public notice for bus monitors, which is pretty easy hours, even if it's just the morning from six to six to seven thirty or so, or six thirty, I'm sorry, six thirty to seven thirty. Uh, so if a parent wants to do that, that's great. Just contact Anna about that because um, we, we desperately need some bus monitors. We, won't, we don't have to do the health checks anymore um, on the bus. 
per guidance, but we would very much like to do the health checks on the bus um, and have those bus monitors. So if we don't have them, we don't have them. We'll do them in the school building, but that, that has consequences. So I just wanted to update the board on the vacancies. Uh, the RVS bus. Um, so our MSMS and MHS bus will run from RVS. They, it, because of the health check piece, and we want to help do health checks on the bus, especially for the RVS bus, because that bus, those kids are on that bus for quite a long time. Uh, that is leaving from RVS at 7.10 in the morning. Um, so, but that is running the first day of school. Um, and I know Katie has talked to the MSMS families and some will be able to drive their kids to school those two days because they're doing a staggered start time to get the routine down. So I have a smaller amount of kids at UES and MSMS doing the routine of the health checks in the first couple days. Um, but that bus is running because MHS has to get, the kids from MHS have to get to school too. So, um, so families can take that. Um, as far as the Roxbury Village School bus, we have six families who have said that they need that bus. Um, but, and Beth, who I'll let her add on to this if I've, if I've missed anything, Beth has um, done an amazing job and talked with the person who does the daycare at RVS to offer early morning child care um, should we decide to not run that bus so parents could drop their kids off anytime after, what is it, Beth? It's anytime after 7.15. So she's offering morning care from 7.15 to 7.40 for those parents most impacted by the bus. And we, and she's offering at a very low rate that the district would pick up for child care. Yeah, we can, uh, we can, Five dollars per morning, which. Yeah, so the, we can pick that up and we can use our CRF funds to do that. Um, if we decide, so again, there's six families, seven kids who want the RVS bus. The savings to the district would be $42,870 uh, for this school year, should we not run that bus. Uh, the capacity for the bus is 77 kids, and we have seven who need it to run. So there's a very good possibility that most many mornings there would be no children on that bus. Um, so that's a decision that, um, I'd love feedback from the board about. It's a considerable amount of savings. I understand the uh, ramifications it has for families. Um, and Beth has done a yeoman's job to, to get another alternative in place for families as well. Uh, RVS Pre-K, we, we have, don't have a teacher. The teacher has chosen to retire. We do have that position posted. It's been posted for over a week. We have zero applicants. We don't expect to have many applicants to hire a pre-K teacher on a regular basis. It's not the easiest task. Um, Ryan, do you remember how many candidates you had this year for Sadie's position in a normal hiring cycle? I want to say six or seven. Yeah, we don't get many, right? Um, sorry to put you on the spot, Ryan, for that. Um, so we don't have many applicants. Uh, we're going to leave that up for about two more weeks and see if we can get an applicant to, to get our pre-K um, situation going. Uh, the daycare provider has, has offered to do daycare for the entire day, correct, Beth, for any family who needs that? Yes, and we were able to connect with, I believe it's three families, four children, don't quote me on that, um, who are taking advantage of her offer to provide childcare during that normal preschool block. So we have made other accommodations for families who might need it during that time in the same space, uh, but with a daycare provider, not pre-K. She's not, she's not licensed for Act 166 funding or anything like that. She's not a licensed pre-K teacher. Um, so it's not pre-K, but we'll leave that position up for a couple more weeks and see if we get any good applicants. Uh, but if we don't, then we won't be doing pre-K at Rock, Roxbury this year. Bus monitors, like I said before, we need three currently, um, four including the Roxbury, no, five including the two Roxbury buses. Um, we weren't, we knew we would have a challenge at finding Roxbury monitors because we have in the past, uh, but Montpelier we usually had taken care of. Uh, so we have put that out to the public to see if anybody can get, uh, we can get any takers. 
Uh, my next step would be to offer different, well, I have offered different hours to the IAs who want to take it. That doesn't seem to be a big pull. So the next step will be to offer a different pay for the bus monitor piece um, to try to get bus monitors. But there is a large possibility we won't have them for the first day of school or for the first bus run, rather. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about numbers right now. Main Street Middle School in particular has 20 to 23 kids in a class. They are at their max capacity at the moment. Um, we are able to fit the kids in with own six feet of distance, except for maybe fifth grade. <laughs> Katie, they might be a little bit closer in fifth grade, um, but they still have some space apart from each other. Uh, but we're really at our max with Main Street Middle School, and uh, that led me to think about um, the the num new enrollment data that the dis the I thought the school board might be interested in. So as of today, we have 79 new children um, enrolled in our district. We have 19 at UES, seven at RBS, but we've also lost 15 students at RBS. So it's um, not in the way we want at RBS. At MSMS, we have 15 new enrollees, and at MHS, we have 38, uh, which I asked the registrar if that was a interesting number to her, and she said the only thing that rivals it was two years ago when we had 50 new enrollees, so that 38 number is pretty big um, for MHS, which equals 79 new kids, and just in case you're interested, for home study, uh, last year, uh, we had... We have, well, this year we have 52 students who are doing home study and 19 of those students are new. So we have a considerable amount more new enrollees than we do um, kids we're losing for home study. We might actually have eight, 80 new kids because I think there's a new kid coming into UES too that may not be a part of these numbers just yet. Um, so our numbers are in the right place for us, um, but at MSMS is my biggest concern that we really can't fit many more kids in those classrooms, so we need to safely. So um, so we have to take anybody who comes our way. So Katie and Joy, the registrar there, are watching that closely and letting me know that there could be a shift or a pivot should we get a lot more new enrollees at MSMS in terms of scheduling and breaking kids up and maybe into an AM and a PM cohort. That is a most definite possibility at MSMS. It's, we're pretty good at U UES, correct, Ryan? We're pretty good the way things look at UES right now. Thumbs up from him. Um, and at MHS, they already have the AMPM cohort, so uh, MSMS would probably follow the MHS lead a little bit in that that vein. Um, but but it is a definite possibility that could be a switch in the future. Uh, I'm going to stop there for a second. I have more things to say, but I just want to give everybody a chance to ask questions if they have any questions on that. Any things. questions for Libby? Emma. Um, I'm wondering about the uh, preschool position. Did you end up, I, I see that you asked Ryan um, and said that there maybe was a hiring process at UES earlier in the year. Did you go back and look at the applicants who applied for that position and contact them and tell them that we have another open position at another one of our schools? We did that hiring in April, April, early May. That that hiring was a long time ago. So we could go back and we have not, but we could. Um, but they, that was a long time ago for, that we did that hiring. That was one of the very first hires we did actually um, this school year. So I, I we could. I just don't think they'd still be available at this point if they haven't applied for it. Yeah, other, other questions or comments? One more, sorry. Um, with the bus for Roxbury Village School, um, first of all, I, I just want to thank the people who came out and spoke tonight about that because we had kind of, there had been a little bit of a gap in our understanding of what the individual families um, what their needs were, so I appreciate that public comment. Um, I'm wondering, so you, you gave us the number of the amount of savings. We had also discussed reaching out to individual families and surveying them to find out if there was a way for us to get creative in a solution for each individual family. Did that um, communication happen? I believe Beth reached out to, to most families, and 
and the key to remember is that most most families this this challenge isn't going to be solved because we give them a gas card that the the challenge is that they need a a ride to school um because of i have to get to a job or or something of the of the sort right um so it's a time situation but beth i believe you reached out to each of the families i did i contacted each family personally and i talked to them about their situation from that i learned that most of it was that they needed to get their child on a bus so they could get to work and so um, just seeking a creative solution to that, I reached out to Jenny from Kangaroo Care to inquire whether she would provide morning care and she agreed to. And then I reached back out to those families to make it known to them that they could contact Jenny for their early morning care. So just to clarify, the early morning care would be that um, a parent who typically would send their child on the Rossbury Village School bus would bring their child early to the daycare center and drop off. And then there would be, is kangaroo care right at the village school? I'm not oh, like, so, okay. So they would just start their school day from there. That's correct. And they would come in the back entrance, be temp check there. And then when school actually begins at 740, they would be dismissed to the classroom to join um, their regular class at that time. Anything, anything else? Thank you, Beth. One question. So the does that solve the busing situation for okay. somebody who I'll keep going, but feel free to ask questions about that first part at any time too. Mm -hmm. Um calendar. So I think Jerry was asking questions. Sorry. Can you, can you hear Jerry, Libby? I can't see yeah. Jerry. Can you hear I'm me? I'm sorry, I can't see or hear Jerry. You are frozen, oh. Libby. Yeah. Am I now? Oh. Yeah, 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 I think Jerry was asking if it fixed the bus question. Yeah, so the bus question. Um, I'm moving to where the router is. I'm sorry, I can get a nice <laughs> tour of my home. Wait, the, does that bus, um, what about for the people who oh, need I'm sorry, to get I, can't, I literally can't even see Jerry on the Zoom. If you could just tell me what her question is, that would be great. Jerry's in the process of asking Jerry? it right now. That off. Can you, can the other people hear me? We, I can hear you fine. Okay, okay. So if somebody needs to get their child to Montpelier, is that busing situation from is, Am I frozen now? Yeah, yep. you're frozen. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to give up. Go ahead and just turn off your video. Oh, uh, yeah. That might free up some space. Okay, so do you, do you have the gist of my question? Would, would someone still um, have a bus option right, if they need, I need to, to do it? Is Grant on yet? Mike, do you see Grant? He was having computer problems as well. Yes, I'm here, Louie. Yeah. Maybe, Anna, maybe if you could just type into the chat to Libby and let her know that we want to hear Jerry's full question before we continue speaking. Yeah, is the chat? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Hold on. I'll look. Should I just type my question into the chat? I don't I mean, think you can. <coughs> I think the chat might be disabled. I just oh. enabled it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and type your question to Jerry. Thanks. Sorry about this. Okay. That's okay. Technical snafu. I'm going to try to log. I'm just going to try to get out and then come back in. Sorry. And that is still busy. Looks like the chat's still disabled. <clears throat> But if somebody wants to convey my question, it's just can't is the bus from Roxbury to Montpelier still okay for people who need to get their kid from Roxbury to Montpelier? 
Uh, you're basically asking if the rock's great amount of your bus is, is untouched by this and still... Yes. Yeah. That's correct. I'm... The answer to that is, is yes, but that's what we get moving back on. So okay. Can. It also sounded to me based on the testimony that we received from the two parents who used the bus um, that whatever solution was presented to them either wasn't clear or it didn't solve their problems. Yeah. Yeah, that's where, where I was confused as well. It sounded like there was going to be a problem getting kids to Montpelier as well. <laughs> is not back. I don't yet see Lily trying to sign on. Yeah, I wonder if she's trying to do something with her router. Maybe someone could text her and ask her to call in. Is there a call in number? There is, yeah. Jim, do you know if we're taking action, like voting on the Roxbury Village school bus tonight? I, uh, she's trying to call out. I don't believe we are. Um, It sounded like um, Libby was looking for input, though. I think she is looking for input, but I, I asked her earlier on Ryan's urging if um, we needed an, an action item, and um, she did not say that we did. Okay, looks like she's having some serious computer problems. Um, so I feel like I'm just a little bit confused. It, it sounds like we need a solution um sooner than school yes yes um and that we don't have another meeting before then so i think i'm just not clear on how the decision gets made or if you know what happens to families who can't do this without the bus if we don't make a decision this evening so my well, understanding is that's, that's an question. administrative decision, but she was seeking our input. Um, that's how I was hearing it. And yeah. maybe because it's a, you know, it's a small enough line item that it's an administrative, not board decision. Because, um, yeah, school starts Tuesday. Yeah. I just want to put forward that I personally feel very strongly that, um, the if, if the bus is needed by a kid i'm i personally support using the forty thousand forty two thousand dollars that's already committed to make sure that kids get to school rather than try to to change the plan based on dollars when we're not in as dire a financial situation as we could be i think this will be back on Hello, everyone. Hello? I can hear you. Yeah, yep. you. I am so sorry. Literally, I have two Macs in front of me, and both of them are not working. I don't know why. That happens yeah. of our virtual world. Right. So, uh, so, so just kind of give you.
Oh, no worries. So to kind of give you a, a an overview of what we've been talking about um, in the last couple of minutes, I think um, I've heard two things. I've heard one, there's, um, I think, a desire on, for clarity on the part of the board on what exactly you want from us tonight. And then I've also heard a couple of people express that um, that it is more important to provide busing if we've committed busing than to, uh, you know, save potential money, even if it's a very tiny number of kids. All right. So the way I, the way I see this, the way I see it from a board's perspective is that you are the financial stewards of the district. And so if, so it, we are about to hit, as Grant will to share with you later, a financial cliff. And so I, I felt it was my role to put this out to the board that, the, that, that transporting seven kids um, for, for $57,000 is an extor exorbitant cost. Um, so if the board feels they still want to pay that money to transport those kids, uh, despite the fact that we have a different, uh, more cost-effective route to go, then that's fine. We'll, we'll do that. We budgeted for it. We were expecting to do it. We'll do, we'll do it. But as the financial steward of the district, um, from the board's perspective, I felt the need to let the board know that that was the situation. Um, Libby, my question, this is Mara speaking, my question was that it so sounded like the two people who spoke during public comment aren't, do, do not have an accommodation that works for them, and I, I feel like the implication is that, the, that we have an app, um, a cost-effective means of addressing that, um, and those just aren't matching up for me. I didn't speak to those two, so I wonder if Beth, Beth, if you if you spoke to to parents or, and what their response was to the uh, to the to the, 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 the. I did speak Wait. to. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So um, I made an effort to reach out to every single parent that I knew would be impacted by the bus and made contact and I don't have my notebook in front of me, but I do leave lots of messages. I talked to lots of people. Um, but to my knowledge at that point, that was the best solution that we could come up with should there not be a bus. Because I felt like it was our duty as a district to make it work somehow, even if we couldn't have a bus. So it was really more of a workaround at this point. And um, we were looking at solutions the last time we met and I felt that this was a solution, maybe not the perfect solution, but it was an alternative to solve a problem. So I've got a question. I'm, I'm, um, this is Anakin. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting confused. Is the solution to have the, um, the child care provider in the, uh, in the RVS school um, or is, I mean, I'm, I'm getting confused. Is, are they getting to Montpelier and uh, that by the bus? But the solution is to have them at RBS? Uh, no, there's, there, you're talking about two different things, Anakit. So okay. there, there's one bus that is running from Roxbury to Montpelier for our MSNS and our MHS students. That, that's, not, that's, not, that's not in question. That is running. Um, the, the bus that's in question is for the Roxbury Village School that has seven children lined up for it, six different families um, who have stated they need a bus, um, but, it, but we don't have any option other than running a large bus, other than running a 77 capacity bus, person capacity bus. Um, so the workaround that Beth created was to have very early morning daycare provider and provided. So if a parent needed to drop their kid off very early at Roxbury Village Field, we're talking kindergarten through fourth graders. We're not talking anybody above fourth grade um, who need that bus, then we could do that. Um, and the district could pick up that tab at a very at a much considerably less dollar sign. But if the board decides that we budgeted for that money and we will pay that money for that bus, then we'll do that. Because um, we have budgeted for it and we were prepared to pay for it. Uh, we are also going into an incredibly hard budget year. And so the, 
that a bus is not cheap. So we just, I just felt like the need to let the board know that this is a considerable cost to the district um, and there are other things that we could do. Once, so, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Annika. Um, so the, the bus option is to get the seven kids from their house to the um, RVS, Rockbury Village School, um, where the school starts at 7.40. One of the parents mentioned that, you know, it's going to be hard to drop them off at 7.40 if there's no bus. Um, so the solution is if you can drop them at 7.15, then there'll be a child care provider. Is that correct? Yes, you're correct. So what was the piece about Montpelier that it just sound, I'm, I still I'm so sorry everyone I just feel very confused as to what the parents at the beginning were yeah I can were, I can clarify that Mara <laughs> so UES and MSMS are starting their buses two days later um, and so so when when they were talking about that they were talking about not running the rvs bus to montpelier as as well and i didn't know about that so we clarified today that that bus has to run because we have montpelier high school students on it as well um so that bus will be running to montpelier and we can and yes we're still going to do the starting start times at at msms for the different grade levels but we'll make it work for the for the students who come in on the bus from roxbury that's not it's it's a challenge, but we can overcome that challenge pretty pretty easily. So well, yeah, I think there's just some misconceptions there. I also think the other piece of this is that there might be some middle school age children in Roxbury to catch the bus to RBS in order to catch the bus that comes to Montpelier. That was not planned for the rock for the bus com the bus company is not expecting that. So that may be a parent expectation, but that is not an expectation from the bus company. The, the children wouldn't be able to get to the get to Montpelier in time for that to happen because the bus from Roxbury to Montpelier has to leave at 710 in order to get to Montpelier on time for school start. So that thanks Grant. That was that's not an option for families. It never was an option for families. So if, if you're a Roxbury parent of a student who's coming to Montpelier for school, you've always, you, you had to last year and would again this year have to drive them to RBS. You did it last year. It was door to door pickup last year. Oh, so that was different. We, okay. Yeah, that's different because we didn't have to do health checks. So our goal and uh, our goal is to do health checks before kids get on that bus. We may not be able to do that in Montpelier because we don't have the bus monitors. We may not be able to do that at RBS. So the reason why the, the location changed for to meet at Roxbury Village School was because we didn't have a bus monitor for that. And we need to health check the kids before they get on the bus. So somebody at Roxbury Village School would do the health check before the kids get on the bus. That was the reason for that change this year. Last year, but kids were picked up by Northfield because our bus company also drives Northfield, Williamstown, and all those, and Barrie. Um, so because the Roxbury is so spread out um, that some kids were getting on the Rock, the Northfield bus, driving to a point where Northfield and Roxbury buses crossed, getting off the Northfield bus and onto the Roxbury bus, we can't do that this year. That's not possible because of the situation we're in. Um, I want to say two things. First, I echo Mara's uh, feelings about around equity. If we're busing some of some of the elementary school kids in our district and not others, that feels off base to me, um, especially if we've already budgeted it and that's the expectation. So I, I would feel strongly that unless we're able to connect with all six families and confirm that the kangaroo care or whatever, the, the early child care at RES was a suitable solution for them, then I feel like we probably should commit to what, you know, follow through with our commitment to bus the kids. Um, and then the second thing that I think we should address that I don't, I don't know how to address, but um, the two people who spoke in public comment from RBS um, were concerned about sort of the future of the bus. So is this really a COVID specific issue 
And are we planning to, you know, if, if we do cut the bus, is that really just because of COVID? And, yeah, it is. The, the majority of the one is that Emma's or is that me? I just have I to think make was, I think it's Emma's. Okay. 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 Yeah. Is there should I wait, Jim? I think go ahead. Um, she looks like she's pretty hung up for a future years. So, um, so this is just a thing. The vast majority of Roxbury students typically ride the bus. Um, so, if we have thirty-five students, we usually have about 30 who ride a bus. In the afternoon, it's less because of the Bridges program. So on an, on an average year, this, this is not an average year. So students and parents have decided they don't wanna put their kids on a bus and, the, and we have a very small amount of kids who need to go on a bus. This is, but this is not an average year. This has never been discussed before this year. Libby, I have a question for maybe you or Grant. The number you presented tonight for the costs for running the bus was lower than we had heard in our last meeting? No, it's the cost to run the bus is $57,000. The savings, should we choose not to run that bus, is $42,870. Okay. Um, specifics about the contract. Would STA allow us to run the bus just in the morning? Would that be an option? Probably. That. We so have it seems a like that could be a really good solution for the position we're in right now because you had just mentioned, you're absolutely right, ridership in the afternoon is historically much lower than the mornings. Yeah. And if we can get the kids there, they'd have either the after school program or the kangaroo care daycare program to take care of the kids who would need to be picked up later than the bus route. Um, so is that sort of just a run in the morning has not been presented or considered with SDA? I have not presented that to STA, but I certainly can. We've talked, STA and I have talked about that in years past, but not this year. Um, but Ryan, you make a very good point, because I believe, Beth, I don't know if you have these numbers, but I think the last time Casey told, told me there were 19 kids signed up for Bridges, and we have about 24 enrolled right now. Is that true? So that sounds about right, based on the last numbers I heard. Yeah, and that's pretty typical. The vast majority of students at RBS do do the after-school program with Casey. I guess I'm feeling a little bit stuck tonight. I'm not really sure kind of where to go. I, I'm not totally sure that the families maybe knew that the drop-off with Jenny in the morning was the solution that was going to be presented. Uh, I'm not really sure. Like when I came into the meeting this evening, I don't think I was expecting that to be the only solution or the solution. Um, so I'm feeling a little bit stuck right now in terms of having to make a decision. I think the way I hear the board saying is that we keep we keep the bus run, and then if we see that there aren't any kids in the afternoon because we haven't run that data yet, then we cancel the afternoon run. And SDA has brought that to my attention before, so that makes sense to me. We can we can do it that way as well. But if there are kids in the afternoon, a considerable amount of kids, then we keep the afternoon run as well. Does that make general sense to folks? Would that be half of the savings? Half of that amount? I don't know. I don't know how it works. Grant, do you know? Do you have an idea there? Uh, these the savings is about seventy percent of the full cost, and so. I didn't find out what the savings would be for half, but I assume it would be half. So a forty-three thousand dollars savings, it would be twenty-one and a half. And then, meanwhile, if they could get a smaller bus, they can't. They've already. I've already. Really well. Okay. They're all being used by students with special needs. Um, Libby, are people, I know, so I'm thinking about the, the online option and how, like, if you opt into virtual school, you're in virtual school, you don't get to switch, right? Um, what is our thing on people switching bus and ride options? Are people allowed to change that as circumstances shift through the year? 
Yeah, parents do that all the time. And so uh, we, we talked to the UES parents. Ryan had a UES meeting last night. And, and I mean, the parents just let us know around that piece. We do have to take attendance and all that kind of stuff on the bus this year, which we've never had to do before. Um, but they just be marked absent that day. So there could be more people later that decide they want it. Or there could be people who end up figuring something out and eventually we don't need it. Is it a thing where we have to make the decision with the bus company now? And so in if the situation has changed in a month, we can't cancel it. What I would say, Mara, is that the bus company works for us. Um, they're contracted with us. And we can make changes. However, they are also employing people and, and relying on us for that money. Um, so, and we have to, in our contract, we have to give them a significant amount of time before changes can be made. But there is a, there is a part of our contract that allows us to make changes in the contract. I think we just need to give them like 60 days notice or something like that. And thank you for reminding me that the person who's driving the bus would like some assurances on what's happening. I appreciate that. Yeah, that brings up an interesting question. Is the is there like an RBS bus driver that we've had for years who's who no. for the, 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 RBS, the RBS bus driver is the one that we can get to ride, drive the R or that SDA can get to drive the RBS bus. So they may have the similar driver, but that's coincidence, not not tradition. Um, can I just go on the record as saying I would I would like to do as Libby had suggested and that we want to move forward with um, continuing with the bus and then if ridership in the afternoon drops off that's always an option it sounds like I feel very strongly that um, this is an unprecedented time and the idea of taking away one of the few pieces of this puzzle for families and students right now would be not worth the savings and i think if we are about to be asked to make significant financial savings which i completely respect and understand the work you guys have put into trying to find a solution this is in no way a criticism of that that i i think there might be other places i would want to look first and i also um i get a little worried when we start to parse out the budget by students because then it starts to become um, a bit of finger pointing in the same way that we don't want to talk about special education students and what they might cost or busing versus not busing. So, um, you know, to the to the folks, I think they're still on the call, the parents that, that came to this. Um, I, I, I just, I don't care if it's three kids. I, I would, I just, if we're, if we're being asked to cut the budget to that level of detail, I'd like to start somewhere else because um, for those families that is, that is absolutely a lifeline for their kids to get to school. So um, I hope that's helpful. And thank you all for all the work that you've done to try to figure this out. And I hope I'm proven wrong, but I'd, I'd like to keep that that one one piece of normalcy for those kids if we can. Well, it seems like um, it seems like a pretty strong consensus on this. Does anyone feel differently um, that we should alter or cancel the bus? Um, and go with the other option. Yeah, I, th I think that's I think that's the consensus of the board. Libby, do you do you have what you need on that? Yep, I'll let Stacy know that the bus is going to run at RBS, and we'll watch the afternoon ridership. Great, thank you. Thanks for um, thanks for trying to think of solutions, and thanks, board, for the. For the input and for um, everyone for su supporting families. Um, do a couple more things. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. We, we uh, know. In the board packet, you got half a year calendar. The reason why you got half a year calendar is because the the statute for student days is 175. We have to have 175. Um, it has been asked of the legislature by five different people in the past week to reduce the student days from 175 to 170. We have every hope and understanding that that is gonna happen at the legislative level. It's uh, the VSA, the VSBA, the NEA, and uh, the Secretary of Education have all testified saying that they, meet, they would like the 170 statute change for one year. 
Um, but because we don't know that yet, I put out the, calen the calendar to you all for a half a year so that I didn't have to do that multiple times. People didn't have to make, pl make plans and then change it once again because it's already been changed so many times. So that's why um, we have until December, until, this, until the end of December, it's pretty set um, and it looks pretty good. Uh, there are a couple changes in there that parents should really note, um, and some things for our teachers could be able to knock out some teacher days in there as well. So because we did parent conferences in the beginning of the year this year, we're not doing them in the fall this year. Um, we just switched those around. That's a, that's a pretty big change for teachers in particular. Uh, so uh, happy to take any questions about the calendar, but that's why it's only the half year. And once we know about that 170 versus 175 days, then we'll we'll go ahead and, and get the rest out to everybody. Um, I know that that that's a little bit of consternation, but you know, right now nobody's going anywhere anyway. So <laughs> go ahead, Anakin. Um, is this a district calendar, right? Um, yeah. Which would include the online piece as well, especially the the VTVLC. It is. However, VTVLC, um, uh, I learned today that VTVLC has a, a significant increase in students, understandably, this year. So their online classes will start September 14th this year. So in the next week, Mike and Sue Monami, our librarian at um, MHS, will be working with students to work on their professional learning or their, I'm sorry, personalized learning plan um, and making sure all their goals are set for the year. Um, that will be the school the school attendance and things for next week, and then VTBLC will start on September fourteenth. Okay, so the the five days for those kids would be um, it'll still start on eight. Yes. It's just yes. it's just not VTBLC learning is exactly exactly. Okay. The guidance under attendance for virtual learning is still pretty broad. Where that has never been rescinded from the spring. So it's still pretty broad in that sense. So we're going to rely on that in order to get the attendance markers down for VTBLC students um, starting September 8th. And how confident are we that VTCLB will have, will be ready to go the 14th? Mike? A little over 50%. <laughs> I, I think they will. Okay, that's. I think they will. Um, the reason I say that is that we literally found out about the change in date yesterday at 4 p.m. Um, and it's obvious that their system is overloaded at the moment. And I speculate that the 14th is going to be a solid start date. Um, but we've had enough changes in the last two days that I, I don't want to say for sure. What I know right now is the 14th. A slightly weighted coin toss. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, so, as the calendar, um, and then I have two other things. One, I'm going to switch the order a little bit because then I'll let yeah. Grant. I have a question on the calendar. Go ahead. Yep. Um, so, are the days that you've designated here? Um, September through December, is that based on the 170? And if the legislature decides to change the 170, um, is there any chance that this calendar that we see in front of us will change based on the reduction in mandatory days? No, that's based on the 170. What you see, the, the calendar that you see there is not gonna change. And can you explain um, that you said no parent-teacher conferences through December? Right. Oh well, unless the parents request one, we we do them on, we do them when they're requested at a, at any given time, but not the two two days dedicated to parent conferences like has been in the past because we've already done that this fall or this uh, in service. Sorry. Okay. Um, because it does seem like um you know with everything that's so different that parents might be very interested to find out how their student is doing with the new face of schooling, public education. And I would absolutely recommend that they contact their teacher and, and make a meeting because teachers will do that if they need one. Um, we also, with the, with the student days the way they are, we have a certain amount of teacher contracted days. 
And so we had to get rid of some. Um, and so because of our long in service this year, we couldn't have those were those were days that we decided to not make teacher days so that we would be contractually okay. I think it's important to know a lot of this is contractually driven, but um, yeah, to reiterate that, um, you know, parents should definitely be in frequent contact with, with teachers, especially if they have questions about how things are going and, you know, teachers will be responsive. Absolutely. And are teachers still contracted through like 3.30 or 4 or whenever they were? Yep, they're contracted days from 7.30 to 3.00. That hasn't changed, and it doesn't matter if they're a virtual teacher or an in-person teacher. That's their contracted hours. Um, okay, so the good news from the federal government standpoint is that they have further waived the free food for all kids under 18 through December 31st. So we're still under summer, summer food rules through in the beginning of the school year. Um, which both provides a benefit and a detriment to our food service. But so each school is developing kind of an ordering system so that they know how much food, excuse me, to make for kids um, each day, but nobody will have to pay for any kind of school meal for breakfast or lunch going forward through December 31st. So that's very good news. I'll, I'll spread that word tomorrow in my parent newsletter. Um, and then the last piece is a 5-6 virtual teacher, and this requires some board action. So our 5-6 virtual teacher uh, is beautifully pregnant. Um, and so we had already put out for a long-term sub for her, um, a virtual sub for her. However, our 5-6, because we're doing that multi-age, we didn't have quite enough to split the two, split it into two classes. But now, um, now that the numbers are sugared out, we have just over our class size um limit for five six in our virtual so because wendy is so very pregnant um we would like to ask the board to make that a full a one year full-time um position so that wendy and the teacher can co-teach for the year um in that virtual setting mike do you want to add anything else to that piece i would just say additionally we've only had two applicants for the long-term sub that we have posted and only one of them was qualified and was hired immediately in another district. So we've had no applicants since then. Um, so a one-year position is probably more likely to be attractive. And because it's virtual, we can get a little more creative with the catchment area. Great. <clears throat> um, so this wouldn't be a permanent position. It would be just intended as a one-year. One-year. Yeah, one-year position. Do you need a motion from the board on that? Yeah, we did. we put that under board action. I just kind of moved it up in the agenda. Sorry, Jim. Okay, I moved it above above Grant. Um, yeah, and then I let Grant. I'll let Grant go all together. Yes. Um, anything we need to know more about that, or can I entertain a motion? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Um, does someone want to move to approve the five six virtual teacher hire? I move that the board approve the five six virtual teacher hire. No, a second. I second. I second. Uh, who was that? Sorry, it was Jerry. Oh, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Um, any discussion? Jill. Aye. Anakin. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Bridget. Aye. Emma? Aye. Uh, Jerry? Aye. Mara? Aye. Great. Uh, motion is approved. Um, and now turn it over to Grant for what I'm sure will be all good news. <laughs> yeah, we only have three years to cover, so I think we can get it done in about 15 minutes. Um, the good news is uh, one of the first things you got is a draft fourth quarter report from FY20. Um, and that was very good news. We finished with a surplus, it appears, for FY20, which will help immensely 
for FY21 when I assume we are going to end up finishing with the deficit. Um, we discussed this at the Finance Committee last time, uh, last time there was a board meeting, so I'm not going to go into detail now, but the surplus was stated as perhaps $790,000. This is still a draft report because we haven't finished our audit. But I already think that that 790 is a little um, aggressive. Uh, we just heard from the AOE that there's some costs that they're not going to fully reimburse. And it also assumes that we're going to get 100% of what we asked for in CRF money, um, which I asked for 42,000. So I'm thinking the surplus for FY20 is probably going to be closer to 700,000, which is still incredible. It's very good news and will help us out a lot for FY21. Um, FY21, there's a lot of unknowns right now. Um, we don't know for sure how much we're going to be paying for all these extra costs. We also don't know how much we're going to get reimbursed, whether it's from the CARES Act, meaning CRF and ESSER, or now the latest uh, monkey wrench that got thrown in is last week, uh, we were told that FEMA has a pot of money that we can try to get. Um, that all sounds great, but realize these are all federal funds, which come with a whole lot of hurdles to jump over. Um, one of the big questions I have is whether or not if we pay for salaries, are we going to have to pay a federal grant assessment, which Mike has to worry about for consolidated federal grants, and it's like 15%. So there's a lot of unknowns on what we're going to get from federal funding, how that's all going to work, um, what the applications are going to look like. So I just don't know how much we're going to get backfilled, but uh, the fact that we finished with 700000 extra in FY20 really puts us in good shape to be able to try to absorb those costs if, you know, in worst case scenarios where we have a lot of increased costs and don't get a lot of reimbursement for it. Um, so that's kind of FY21 or 20 and 21. Wanted to talk a little bit about the, the FY22 budget. And I was going to start with the timeline document that you got, and I'm not going to read through everything, but um, we are going to start talking as a leadership team within the next two or three weeks about budget personnel requirements for FY22. So we're getting that started like around the middle of September. By the middle of October or so, we should have enrollment projections and class size analysis that we can give to the administrative team so that we can have a better conversation about staffing. That milestone is a little worrisome to me because I'm not sure how smoothly like October 1 counts are going to be, um, how if there's any kind of anomalies with this year's counts, what that might do to our projections, but we'll do the best we can. Um, October and November leadership team will be meeting several times to go over budget and staffing. Um, the beginning of December is when we get a lot of key information. The AOE is supposed to give us an equalized pupil count. Um, dollar yields come from the commissioner of taxes. Um, and hopefully we'll get those data points on at a timely, in a timely way. Um, December 2nd is when we're scheduled to have our first um, budget with the board, with the full leadership team. And then we'll have a few more of those. Um, January 20th is the big date where we have to finalize the budget. The board has to approve the budget so that we can have a warrant signed and meet the timelines for warnings for the budget vote. March 1st will be the informational hearing. And March 2nd, of course, will be the vote. And then I'm going to go to the, there's a two-page budget discussion document that I believe you all have. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time with some of the statewide issues. Um, I already kind of mentioned a little bit about COVID-19, CARES funds, and now FEMA is part of that too. We don't have a solid estimate on how much money we're going to spend. Um, I did submit a CRF application, grant application that was, um, I think it was like $440,000 that we were estimating that we might need from CRF money. Um, but we don't know if we will need that full amount or not. There were some placeholders in there, and I'm not sure that we'll get that full amount. It depends on if the CRF money runs out. Um, 
The dollar yield is, as if you've gone through a budget process, you know the dollar yield is one of the most uh, significant factors in our tax rate calculation. Considering the poor health of the education fund, I wouldn't be surprised if that dollar yield stayed flat or even decreased. Usually there's an inflationary increase. Um, if that doesn't increase or if it in fact decreases, it can make a dramatic spike in tax rates. Um, the Ed Fund, the last I heard, the, the shortfall is actually down to $66 million, which that sounds horrible, but it was worse. Um, and they're also keeping a $38 million reserve, so they might even tap into that a little bit. But it's still not a healthy fund, um, Ed Fund. Um, equalized pupils, uh, Libby just mentioned that there's some, some things in front of the legislature to try to hold harmless for equalized pupil counts. That would be great because with homeschooling now, with uncertainty about how October 1 counts are going to go and ADM counts are going to go, it's quite possible we can see a drop in equalized pupils. And if that drops, your spending per pupil and tax rates go up. So I'm hopeful that the legislature will, in fact, approve some kind of a hold harmless where um, one of the things they're asking for is that maybe our ADM for this, this coming year stays level with last year, in which case our equalized pupil counts would remain fairly level, which would be good news. Um, common level of appraisal for those of you that are tax rate nerds like me. Um, common level of appraisal is a factor at the very end that we have no control over. It's based on sales information um, for home sales in the past two years, I think it is. And if that CLA drops, your tax rate goes up and you can't do anything about it. I'm very concerned this year about CLA dropping because it is, as you probably all know, a seller's market right now in Vermont. Everybody wants to come to healthy Vermont and get out of the urban areas. So if sellers are getting their price that they want or even getting an inflated price, that could drive the CLA down which could have a dramatic impact. Um, a 2% drop in the CLA is four cents on the tax rate. So it's huge. Um, health rates, of course, are probably gonna go up in the double digit range they have for the past few years. I'm not gonna talk about, the statewide healthcare bargaining wasn't a big impact to us. Act 173 is gonna be delayed again. That's a change in the, ed, the um, special ed funding formula. Um, then I break it out into pressures and opportunities. Pressures, salaries, of course, is a big pressure because that's, you know, over 70% of our budget is salaries and benefits. And all of our bargaining unit agreements, as you're painfully aware, are going to expire this year. So we're going to have to redo all of our bargaining unit agreements. So that means we're going to have to make some assumptions in the budget process, which I mean, it's not unheard of. We had to do it last year as well. But Salaries is always going to be a pressure because even a minor increase in salaries is a big dollar amount. Um, staffing, high school staffing might need to increase in FY22. We looked at that last year. We were on the, on the verge of needing to add some FTE. The good news is it looks like middle school might be stable, depending on these new kids that Libby was just talking about. Um, but Actually, it might be time to uh, look at reductions at Union. Um, there's like this bubble of kids that's going through and is hitting the high school, but the lower grades are starting to come in lower than the past few years. So we'll have to look at our class size analysis and determine whether there might actually be an area where we can make a few reductions. Um, special education is always on there because it's an unknown. For the past few years, we've had fairly low special ed costs, so it could continue or that trend could reverse itself. You never know. Um, technology will probably have a big increase in FY22. We're buying a lot of one-on-one -on -one devices or one-to-one -one devices for students. We're seeing a lot of damage to those since they're going home. Um, so we're probably going to have to replace a lot of student devices. And um, Mike can also tell you that 
because we've been so focused on student devices, we haven't done a whole lot of purchases for teacher devices. So we've kind of built up a bow wave of requirements for teacher devices. Um, food service will probably be a little bit of a bump, although we had, I think we increased it by like $75,000 to cover a deficit um, going from 20 to 21. We may still have a, an increase again for 22, but it shouldn't be that dramatic, I wouldn't think. And then on the opportunity side, high school tuition, it's our final year in FY22 for grandparented high school choice for Roxbury students. Um, so I have on here that my guess is we're going to have probably a decrease of about $75,000. Um, private pre-K tuition is maybe going to be another savings of about $75,000. But that's good news and bad news. It saves us some money. But if you have less private pre-K kids, you have less equalized pupils. So um, it'll save us some money, but it might reduce our equalized pupil count. And then the big opportunity is fund balance. We've worked really hard over the past several years to build up a fund balance. This is the time where we will be tapping into it, I'm sure. Um, we budgeted $240,000 as a revenue source in FY21. We assumed about $250,000 for 22 and for 23 as well, because we were having to absorb that um, loss of tax rate incentive due to the merger. So, for example, I think it was on here someplace, and I probably skimmed over it. This year's tax incentive for the merger was four cents, and FY22 it drops down to just two cents. And then in FY23, it's gone. So for the next two years, we figured we'd use some fund balance to kind of offset that two cent tax rate increase, if you will, because it's a loss of two cents of, a, of an incentive. Um, we may need to tap into more than 250 uh, in FY22. The good news is we have it. So um, we will have to look at that as we calculate tax rates and see how things are sugaring out that's a great lever that we can switch. You know, we can increase the fund balance to help control the, t the tax rates. The downside of that is if you use a large amount of it in one year, the next year, if you don't, it's the same effect as if you increased your expenses. So you have to really manage it. We can use more to manage the tax rates, but we also have to figure out a way to kind of wean ourselves off of it so that we don't have a cliff in revenues. Um, that's, well, I guess I'll, we always end this day with um, proposed guidance that I kind of read off to you and then you either confirm or change it and tell it back to us so that we can start building a budget. The proposed guidance I wrote down was to consider all the requirements that would improve student learning, of course, that's a recurring, recurring theme. Also look at requirements that would improve efficiency and effectiveness, which that's a recurring theme. Um, but what isn't really a recurring theme and is special for FY22 is for us to really scrutinize staffing levels. In the past five years that I've been here, we've always been looking at staffing as far as what else do we need? What else do we need? This year might be the year that we have to say, what don't we need? What can we live without? What can we shift around? So we will be looking with your approval um, to really scrutinize staffing levels, class sizes, um, and really try to make sure that we bring forth the most responsible budget we can. Um, the key is that um, you usually give us some kind of a goal. And this, I think last year it was to try to limit the increase in that spending to 4%. Uh, this year, because of the tax rate implications statewide with the various factors, I think really we should look um, to limit that increase in that spending to just 3%. So that is kind of, those are my thoughts. And um, I'd really be interested in hearing some thoughts on proposed budget guidance for us to start working with. And then obviously I can take any questions you might have. Gotcha. Yeah. I have a question that it actually might be more of a question for Jill than uh, Grant, but is it possible for the common level of appraisal to go up or to go down in every town? 
or if, if in other words, if all of Vermont is experiencing this bump with um, real estate yeah. going up, what does that mean? It's based on three years worth of their sales data, so it is not going to look the same as in every town, but it could theoretically, they could all go up or they could all go down. Um, it used to be that um, it was a lot more stable, and now there's quite a few in both of those buckets. There's a lot of towns where it's it's really, really um, high, meaning they're overvalued. So, yeah, it could. And the next couple of years is going to be really strange to look at because people might be flocking here, but they're not flocking all places in Vermont equally. Yeah. Um, we, we haven't seen that. That's very true. And you could see an increase in CLA if there's a reappraisal in a town, which I'm sure there'll be one or two, at least there'll be a few that get reappraised. I think we're perhaps going to be getting close to having a reappraisal in Montpelier within the next few years, I would assume. Yeah. I wonder too, is the legislature able to somehow offset or inject the ed fund with CRF money at the statewide level? Is that, because I, I worried this spring, they kept talking about clawbacks and having districts, you know, basically that they would sort of allocate it to the districts, but then they claw it back to put it back in the ed fund. But can, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I don't get him started, Jill. Don't start him off on this. <laughs> I, uh, I have to take some medication before I answer. <laughs> deep breaths, Grant. Just deep, deep breaths. Now, okay, so the way this is supposed to work, when you, you, when you put in for the CRF money, you're supposed to identify what was budgeted already that you are wanting CRF money for. In which case, that's basically saying, look, I already had the money for this, but I want you to give me CRF money instead. And then they would claw back your ed spending grant. Or you can say, these were unbudgeted expenses, and I need you to give me the money to make me whole, and you shouldn't cut my ed spending grant. Right now, the application that I put in for, I reflected everything as being unbudgeted, and give me the money and don't take any money away from me. The reason why I did that is it, it is a very, it's very much of a challenge to execute federal funds. And what I've been begging the AOE for is to give everybody some clear guidance on put in for this budgeted requirement and we'll rubber stamp it. Everybody can do something. Everybody can put in for 5% of your teacher salaries and say it was for planning for remote. If, if they did something like that, all the district's business managers could put a simple application in saying, here's what we want to use the money for, and we know it's going to be approved by them. Unfortunately, the AOE has punted, and they've said, no, we can't tell you what you need to put in your application. So you have to think of, of what you want to do. And then we would have to go through that effort, figure out if it gets approved, jump through all the hurdles that they want us to jump through, and then face auditing for it and make sure that we didn't do anything inappropriate. And there's federal funding requirements that, for procurement, as a matter of fact, that I have to go through a federal procurement form where I have to check to make sure that, they're, um, that they don't have any disbarment actions against them. I have to get multiple bids if I, it, there's all kinds of things that I have to do if I want to execute this money. And they're not giving us any answers. And I've said it to probably 15 different organizations, and Libby will confirm that. Every time I get a chance, I keep saying, you are blowing an opportunity to help make the Ed Fund better. If you just streamline and give everybody some clear guidance on what we can put in for that you won't scrutinize us for and make us regret, then we would all gladly do that. But right now, they're just telling us, good luck, put something together, we'll see how it goes. So, yeah, um, ESSER is the same way. There's a, a grant application that we have to try to figure out how to put that together. And if we do it, then, then um, they are saying that if we go through all those steps that we would lose and spending grant as, as a result, which why would we bother doing that? So 
Yeah, um, so I'm going to stop ranting, but um, if if nobody puts in for budgeted costs, is there a chance they could claw back money? Yes, they could. We, okay. It's happened before with healthcare. Okay. And I know FEMA is not an easy application either. And I know at least for municipalities, the deadline was last night, September 1. So I don't know how feasible it is for you guys to put in for FEMA. I mean, it'd have to be next quarter, I suppose, but. Um, okay. Yeah, and we just heard about that for the first time last week and the application was due this week. And the first application was through June 30th, which we've already gone through our pre-audit. I'm getting ready to host our auditor next week. And they wanted me to put in for FEMA money for FY20 last year. Um, I do think that they're gonna be reopening that for FY21. So with some, a little bit of advance notice, we may put in for the FEMA money. But the idea is FEMA money would cover 75% of eligible costs. And then what they would do is reduce the amount that we asked for from CRF. So it doesn't really help, but we'll see. Thank you. Other questions, comments? For now, does 3% increase in note spending seem like a reasonable goal? I mean, it, it does, It, uh, Bridget? Oh, well, you can go ahead, Jim. I, I was gonna talk about that. I mean, I guess, yeah, go ahead. I mean, my thought is it sounds reasonable given the constraints. Um, I know we've, we've done more in the past. I'm definitely concerned about, uh, you know, the ability to meet our needs, but, um, you know, these are, you know, these, these are numbers we have not faced in the past. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think anything more aggressive than that, uh, we're going to start to get into some tax territory that's going to be pretty scary for a lot of Montpelier residents. Recognize, too, that the, the state could come back and we could say 3% now, the state could come back and say, no, you're not allowed. And so this this will this will be a very interesting budget season. I think very yeah. much off the norm of what we're used to. Yeah. No. And I think there's a um, a pretty decent chance that the state could put some parameters on what we can and can't do that that again we haven't seen previously. Um, Bridget. So. I think my concern is that, you know, before COVID, when we were talking about budgets last fall and building on the work that started the year before, um, we had been really trying to allocate resources and tap resources to try to address equity concerns. And obviously a lot of that work has been um, diverted and everything has been overrun by the need to address um, schooling during the pandemic, but it, it seems to me that our needs are just going to be greater next year, not lower. Um, so I understand that we have to be responsible about the tax rates and we have to keep that in mind, but I'm also really cognizant that I think we're going to have high needs going forward um, as we all recover from this process and try to get back on track and try to meet the needs of kids who have not, you know, did not get a full year's worth of education last year and are going to have a very different year this year um, as we all try to work through this. So I, um, to me, it's, you know, the number is important, but the most important message I would give is that I, I don't think this is a time for a skinny budget. It's a time for a budget that, that meets the educational needs that we see in the district. And then we try to fit see what that is and then and then try to grapple with the consequences of it if, and see if we can afford it but i feel like that always has to be the starting point yeah no i think those are are um really important words and important thoughts and i think um you know another another way to maybe think about it is i think we've thought about a lot of you know a lot of the initiatives that, that matter to us, uh, equity, 
um, you know, closing the achievement gap, et cetera. Um, and I think we thought of those as kind of additional expenses that we would add to the budget. I wonder if now is the time to think about how we allocate our existing budget and if there's ways we can shift our existing resources to achieve those ends without additional resources um, and where you know those savings might be if they exist. And if not, you know, do we I think we'll have to grapple with that and have a discussion about what that means. But um, you know, a lot of times in a budget context that um, you know the the new initiatives tend to be things that that um, you you add on, um, but you know sometimes you can think about in context of of what we're doing and, and how can we we shift existing priorities with similar resources. Well, and I and I I'm happy that that you folks took the time to look into that early retirement incentive. I think that was really forward thinking for a couple of reasons, and I'm hoping that maybe um, there are some if salary and benefits make up that amount of our budget, and the health care is out of our hands to a large extent. That maybe having um, having made that choice this summer, it might have gotten us a little bit more flexibility or at least a little bit more breathing room as you had pointed out there you know the newer educators coming in at a different part than maybe some of the folks that took that retirement so thank you guys again for that because i think that was a mutually beneficial arrangement i echo everything that's been said um really well articulated especially bridget um not that the other two didn't articulate well, but just that I really particularly um, what Bridget said resonate, resonated with me, um, especially around the fact that there is there has been sort of a gap in learning, and we don't know what that what that gap will look like until we get back and are able to assess kids and see where they're at, and I think um, the idea of cutting teachers particularly at Union Elementary School really worries me um, during this year when the, that crucial early learning has no doubt uh, taken a hit uh, since spring. So that was my number one concern with what you said. Okay, if that's uh... If that's it, then I guess what we'll do is we'll, it, we always use that percentage as a target anyway. So it's not like, you know, if, if there's, if we're looking at 3.2% instead of 3%, I'm going to bring it to you at 32 but we'll do what we can. The idea is we need to scrutinize staffing, I think, closer to see if there are areas that we should shift to meet requirements, whether it's equity requirements or social emotional learning you know, we will look at the requirements for all staffing and just not think that we'll keep it level just because it has always been level. Um, we will definitely look at class sizes and all the requirements and have a thoughtful conversation as an admin team. So thank you. Yeah, no, and thank you for um, yeah giving us this overview and um, you know the landscape. This is definitely going to be a um, a harder year than we've had in the past. So um, I think being very very thoughtful about the choices we make um, is going to be important. Um. Next item, and sorry, I got my agenda here buried. Um, a policy reading. Um, Ryan, do you want to uh, give us an overview of uh, the very nice job that the committee did on the transgender policy? I have a couple questions. Ryan or anyone else on the policy committee? Sure, I could give a real quick overview of. How the policy has changed since it was last before the board. Uh, but maybe before I do the update, I just want to take a quick second to acknowledge all the people over the last year to year and a half that have worked on the policy. I honestly don't think I've ever worked on a, 
policy that has taken this long to reach conclusion. And there have been people in all of our buildings outside of our educational system have had input and suggestions made to this policy. And it's definitely the work of a lot of bright individuals. So thanks to everybody who has contributed so far. The, the change that has occurred to the policy since it was last before the board has really been a shift away from a trans-centric approach to the policy. Um, when it was last before the board, the majority of the language in the policy was related to transgender students. Um, we had received some feedback from some of the social workers that we had just shifted to a slightly more gender non-conforming focus. Um, and after the last two meetings with the policy committee, we have really shifted it to be much more inclusive to students in general. Um, so it's not really targeting on um, one specific gender identity. Um, I think any of us on the policy committee would be happy to take any questions anyone might have, but in terms of the, the shift from the last reading, it's really been that movement away from a specific gender identity to a more inclusive overall to all students. Chris. Um, any questions or comments about the revised policy? A couple small ones. Um, like sex assigned at birth is pretty important to a lot of other definitions, but it's not itself defined. Um, should it be? Or is that self-evident enough that it doesn't need to be? I don't think I can answer that question um, terribly well. I'm not sure if anybody else on the committee might be able to. I don't. So you're looking for, when we had a list of definitions at the beginning of the policy, you were considering having sex assigned at birth um, detailed there as well. Is that what you're thinking, Jim? Yeah, just a definition of what it, what it means and kind of maybe to uh, make clear any different, the difference between sex and gender. I mean, I don't think I would see a problem with that. If you have a definition to maybe share or anybody else. I can absolutely find a definition. And I think that that's probably a good idea because sex assigned at birth is I think it's it's something that people might think that they know what they mean and it is not the same as what it means like it isn't biological sex those are separate so I I think a definition is probably helpful okay and while you you think you have access to something that would be helpful and I super do okay great um the other question I had was and maybe I read it wrong but uh for it sounds like for a currently enrolled, enrolled student they may request retroactive changes to their records including name and gender uh, and then it seems like it would be um, up to the discretion of apparently the administrator to make a determination as to whether or not that change would be made whereas former students apparently if they make a request um, or a guardian makes a request on their behalf that the change will be made. So it's it's mandated at the request of the student. Why is it discretionary for a current student, but not, why, why isn't it mandated for a current student as well? If they want that change. Let's see, I might let Mara respond to this one. But my I, suspicion would be. I was going to say, I feel like that might be one of those questions of will, like the actual word will that came up. Um, so I was actually going to ask Bridget. <laughs> but Bridget didn't look like 
she was responding, so. Well, I think it's different because to help me find this in the student is in the building, they are actually in the space to be interacting with other students and faculty, whereas after they've left the building, they're physically not present to have the same types of social interactions. Um, so I, that would be my first blush response to that question. But. It's, it's the last two paragraphs of student records, and it says a student or guardian of yes. a student who's currently enrolled may request retroactive changes. Such requests will be handled on a case-by-case -case basis with consideration of the need to maintain legal accurate records consistent with, you know, federal and state matter reporting requirements, et cetera. Well, I think... So it sounds like I think the difference between that paragraph and the next paragraph is that the next paragraph includes upon receipt of documentation that such legal name had been changed. Okay. Under state law. Whereas the other one. Whereas, does. if it's in the paragraph you're looking at, it's a request where the language is trying to deal with situations where there hasn't been a legal name change. Okay, that's helpful. All right, I think that's all I had. Um, anyone else? Any comments or questions? So third reading, and then um, do we move we'll forward? We need a fourth out? reading, it sounds like. Huh? We'll need a fourth reading, it sounds we'll like. With a the fourth reading, yeah. Language. Should we try to add language in there to address Jim's question for, for current students who have gone through the legal process? I think it's in there, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm reading this wrong. Oh, right, that does say former. Did you say former or current? Yeah, maybe just former or current in that last paragraph. So is that the suggestion? The final paragraph in that section will read, former and current student permanent pupil records will be changed by request? Yeah, I would say former or current, because or encompasses and, but not vice versa. Okay. I, I'm not disagreeing with making the change. I, I think it might be that this policy was really aimed at situations where there, a student's name hasn't been legally changed because there's kind of an underlying presumption that the district has to use the student's legal name and what this policy is trying to address is how to um, how to deal with with those situations where the name, where the student's name hasn't been changed yet legally so To not arguing with the clarity, but I think that might be where that came from. Yeah. But the clarity doesn't um, have any unintended consequences, does it? I'm not seeing them right now, but we've spent a lot of time looking at it. So I don't know, maybe, maybe <laughs> okay. the smaller group should go back and stare at it again and make sure. Yeah. Well, let's, let's tentatively say we'll make that change. And if, uh, if further review indicates that that creates um, some sort of ripple that, that we we might be concerned about, we can we can uh, flag that. Uh, well, thanks thanks policy committee for the great work on this. It's uh, um, it's really well written and well crafted, and uh, we appreciate the the time and thought that went into it. And also, uh, yeah, everyone who contributed because I know it um, I know it got some broad uh, input. So. Uh, excellent work. Um, policy monitoring. Uh, 
Uh, any uh, questions or comments on the policy monitoring piece that moves around um, on parental involvement and board conflict of interest? Board conflict of interest was yours, Jen. I sent it to you and it didn't get done. So we'll get we'll put that on we'll the next. Done. We'll put that on the. Uh, you've been so busy. That I have been so busy. <laughs> no, we'll put that, put that on the next board agenda. <laughs> um, you have homework between then and now. Okay. No, thank you. I I saw those emails and thought it was a form I needed to fill out that I could fill out later, but um, that's a trap of, of glancing the subject line and not doing it. So uh, Mia Culpa on board member conflict of interest. Um, I'll, I'll look at it for the 16th. And uh, um, parental involvement. Any questions or comments? Um, motion to approve the policy monitoring report for parental involvement. Make a motion so, to approve the policy monitoring report for the parental involvement. Um, Bridget, you want a second? I will second. Thanks. Uh, Jill? Oh, well, we've had a discussion. Um, Jill? Aye. Anakit? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Emma? Aye. Mara? Aye. Bridget? Aye. And Jerry had to drop off. Um, Motion to adjourn. Move adjourn. Second. Um, Jill. Aye. Anakit. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Emma. Aye. Mara. Aye. Bridget. Aye. Well, thanks everyone. Um, ended just a little early. Uh, well, uh, happy good start to school. Uh, thanks everyone. Next time we'll uh, we'll hear how it goes, and um, hopefully it goes smoothly. I know you guys have, have done everything you can to make it go smoothly. So uh, knock on wood that the, the fates are with us as well. Yeah. So everybody, keep your fingers crossed. Wear your mask. Stay yeah. apart. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone. Thank good night. You. Bye. Bye. Were you going to talk something else, Anna? No, that was all. It just usually they call out the uh, additions in the motion if it wasn't listed on the paper agenda. They didn't this time, but I think it's fine. Yeah, they were confidential, though, too. Or some of them. Were they all confidential? Yeah, they're all confidential. Those are the new hires. They usually yeah. are just bulleted. It's just a technicality, okay. but I'm sure they meant to approve it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. See you tomorrow morning. I'll be, so I'm going to go up and get that car. Sign my name a couple times and then drop my husband off basically. And then I'll be in probably around 930. Okay. Sounds good. I have a busy morning with the flu clinic and stuff. And yeah. I'll get my flu shot when I get there. <laughs> no rush. Okay. <laughs> See ya. Night.